Congresswoman Debbie Lesko, who represents Arizona's 8th Congressional District, which is um, the west side of Metro Phoenix. Congresswoman, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, I know you've had a bit of a health issue. How are you feeling? You had your gallbladder removed, I think, in September. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing a lot better, and thank goodness. There was a lot of people praying for me, and the prayers worked. So I, I'm <laughs> doing much better. Thank you. Well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. All right, I want to start with a couple of things, obviously, that are happening in Washington. The infrastructure bill that the president did get passed, it passed through the House, the Senate, president signs it, he's selling it right now. Um, you voted against it. Tell me why. Well, the reason that I voted against the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill was because, for two reasons, two main reasons. There was a kind of a low percentage that actually went for roads and bridges and things that people would think of as traditional infrastructure. But then also it wasn't paid for. You know, the Biden administration and the Democrats keep saying this is paid for. It was not paid for. Even the Congressional Budget Office said it wasn't paid for. And we're already have a huge deficit, a huge debt, and I just thought it was irresponsible. Now, here in Arizona, though, it means uh, about $5 billion for highways. That's a lot of money. $225 million for bridge replacement. Airport upgrades, broadband expansion, Colorado River reclamation improvements, light rail, charging stations for electric vehicles. I don't know if that, you know, if that's government's business to get into that. But at any rate, there are some things in there that people may like. And obviously, I think there were 13 or 14 Republicans who signed on to this thing, right? Well, yeah, there definitely are good things in here. There are things that I support, but the way that it works is legislation is packed with all kinds of things that you like and then things you don't like. And so I usually weigh it out, the pros and the cons. Is there more good stuff in it than bad things? In this case, I thought there was more bad things. And so, you know, if it was a smaller amount and if it just was focused, to roads and bridges and things like that, I would have supported it. But it was it was too much. Uh, enough of it wasn't focused on that, and uh, it added to our deficit and our debt because it wasn't paid for. Okay, well, if you didn't like that, then build back better you must like even less because uh, the CBO scored it at $1.8 trillion, about $367 billion added to the deficit over the next decade. But... That's assuming that the programs don't continue on, like pre-K, all of that stuff. The Wharton analysis found that this would raise the overall cost of the package by about $4.6 trillion. That that's the yeah. real cost if the programs that are considered very temporary, just to keep the number down, if they're extended, which they likely would be, right? Oh, they likely would be. I mean, it's unrealistic to think you're going to give away things to people for just one year and that it's going to stop after one year. And the Democrats did that on purpose to try to get the cost down. Uh, they just shortened the program length and figured, okay, we'll pass it next year. The Republicans, I'm sure, will go along with it, even if they took house. Yeah, no, I don't call it the Build Back Better Act. I call it the Build China Better Back Act. Because when you think of it, just about all of the, uh, the things in it incentivize and help China. Um, all of the climate change stuff would, would give all kinds of incentives to build all electric vehicles, to get rid of the post office vehicles that there are now and school bus vehicles and all those things and make them sure that they're all electric. Well, the electric vehicles rely on lithium and cobalt. Who processes that? China. And it, it, what it's not paid for. Again, this is not paid for. It's irresponsible. It adds, what, $80 billion uh, to the IRS so they can hire 87,000 more IRS agents to go after people to give them more taxes. It, it creates amnesty for illegal immigrants. I mean, there's just a lot of bad things in this bill. It's bad for America. I hope it doesn't pass the Senate. Congresswoman, respond to the criticism that Democrats say, you know, the Republicans talk a good game on, on fiscal responsibility uh, when it's stuff that we want. Um, but when, when they're in, in power, they're spending like drunken sailors, too. Respond to that. 
Well, I hope that I'm not spending like a drunken sailor. I try to be a fiscal conservative. Um, no, I, I, I understand people get frustrated with the hypocrisy sometimes. And so we need to be strong, both Republicans and Democrats. When I was in the state legislature, we had to balance the state budget each and every year. I sure wish we had that at the national level. Why can't fact, we? Why can't well, we? We can. I have co-sponsored the balanced budget legislation, but it needs to pass right now. It's, uh, it's not going to pass. Democrats are in control. I don't know if it would pass when Republicans get in control or not. But well, I they had a chance in 94. I mean, there were all kinds of things that Republicans in, in the Republican Revolution of 94, term limits was one of them, quickly forgotten once the Republicans assumed power. Hey, I signed that pledge, too. I'm for the term limit <laughs> pledge as well. Okay. So, you know, I, I'm on the right side. <laughs> Okay, Let, let's ask you about uh, COVID response. I'll start with in the United States. I know you're deathly opposed to vaccine mandates. You've been very vocal about that. Where do you think we are in this? We're going to speak to Richard Carmona about the Arizona response later, and he can even speak about the broader response. But how do you think we're handling COVID right now? I feel like the public is starting to move on, but the politicians haven't. Well, you're right. I'm totally against vaccine mandates. Now, I think it should be up to the person if they want to get a vaccine or not. I personally got vaccinated and got the booster. But I don't think the government should force it on people. And that's why I joined the legislation and the amicus brief against the vaccine mandates. So I'm thankful that the courts at least have put a halt to a lot of these vaccine mandates. I don't think they're lawful. I don't think they're constitutional. Now, as far as COVID, it's a, it's a problem. And I can tell you firsthand, I have known people that have COVID. I've known people that have died from COVID. Um, I talked to Banner Hospital today. They're at 97% capacity here in Arizona. I talked to Mayo Hospital today, and they are at about 100% capacity. So this is, and it's not just all COVID, it's other things too. Sure. But this is a serious issue and people can get really sick. And I know that there's strong feelings on vaccine mandates and mask mandates. I'm against both mandates, but I do think people need to be smart and they need to protect themselves. How do you think Arizona has done on this when you look at Arizona against other states? Do you think Arizona has threaded the needle to try to preserve the economy and deal with public health? Or do you think it tipped too much toward saving the economy? No, I think I think Arizona has done a pretty good job of balancing both. And so we can't shut down the whole economy again. That was disastrous. I mean, then we had to give about out a whole bunch of government relief because government shut down businesses. People couldn't work. We can't go back to that. We have to figure out a way to go forward. I think COVID's here uh, and we're going to have to deal with it from now on out. Unfortunately, I wish the Democrats would be more interested in the origins of COVID. I believe it came from the Wuhan lab, whether it was accidental or intentional, I don't know. But there's a lot of evidence, I believe, that it came from China. Uh, let's pivot to the border. This situation mm -hmm. that Arizona, we're, we're looking at 2 million interdictions on the border this year. That's a 30-year high. It seems that this is going on and nothing is changing. It just keeps going and going and going. What's the deal? It's a total disaster. I talked to the Yuma sheriff today, Sheriff Wilmot uh, in Yuma, and he said they're averaging about 1,000 illegal immigrants a day that they're processing down in the Yuma sector. Um, the other day, their 911 call center was overloaded with illegals calling, especially at night. Uh, trying to get water, trying to get food. They're transporting them to the hospitals. It was overloading the Yuma hospitals. Are we, uh, are we enforcing the remain in Mexico policy? The, the decision's well, been made, but we keep hearing different things that it's not being enforced. Well, according to the sheriff, he said it's effectively not being enforced at all. And uh, How is that allowed? How is that allowed? I don't understand. If the court rules, what's going on? I know. I, you know, Biden doesn't always listen to the courts, does he? He says he does, but then as a matter of fact, it doesn't happen. 
And so, you know, I really believe that Biden and the Democrats want open borders. I mean, it's all in their actions, not what they say. On day one, he stopped construction of the wall. On day one, he got rid of the Remain in Mexico policy that now the courts have said he has to reinstitute, but he's really not. And, you know, because all these people are walking on the streets in Yuma. I mean, the Yuma sheriff sees it firsthand. They're going in their hospitals. They're not being sent yeah. back to Mexico. Let me and so this is a disaster. Juveniles, even U.S. citizen juveniles, the cartel is using to smuggle people because the federal government won't prosecute juveniles. The cartels know that. This is a total disaster. I have sponsored legislation to secure our border. Uh, Andy Biggs has, other Congress members have, but it goes to Judiciary Committee and Chairman uh, Jerry Nadler does not hear it because yeah. they want open borders. That's being the minority policy uh, or, or uh, uh, party. Okay, I've got to ask you about the election audit. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to suss out what your position was on this because you did vote a couple of times uh, to block election results in four states. But in Arizona, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, early on, about a week after the election, you were asked to sign a letter demanding an audit of this election. And my understanding is through your conversation with Clint Hickman on the Board of Supervisors, you told him you weren't going to sign that letter. You, you felt like something wasn't right. Can you explain where you, where you stood on that position? Yeah, I think there was something fishy going on with the election. And, but I don't have the bandwidth to check what is, if, what is right and what is wrong. President Trump had a lot of lawyers to do that. And so far in the courts, he hasn't been able to prove it. Um, is Donald Trump running the Republican Party at this point, do you believe? Or do you think that right now there are some Republicans who are looking for another voice? I think there's a mixture. So when I talk to people, there's a lot of people that would support President Trump for president in 2024. I mean, I was very involved with the impeachment, and so I got to know President Trump. And I know that he really believes strongly in America first. And, and has done a lot of things that were really good for America. But then there's other people I talk to, Republicans, that really love President Trump's policies, but really don't like the person. They don't like the tweets. They don't like that type of thing. Yep. Um, if I would give him advice, I would say, hey, cool it on the uh, negative tweets and the personal Well, he attacks, can't do it now I, because he's being deplatformed. Well, and I don't think he's going to listen to me or anyone. <laughs> okay, one more thing. January 6th. Um, you condemned it, but in the end you voted not to have the House start investigating this whole thing and the origins of it because you thought it, be, it would become too political. Yeah. No, that was a, that was a really uh, bad day uh, for America. Now, I think that a lot of the people there just had really good intentions. They didn't have any ill will. But I think there were some bad actors that planned this. Um, they were prepared for it. And those people have been prosecuted. Now, I don't think it's fair that they're stuck in jails and solitary confinement. I mean, that's just uh, not right. But it needs to go through the regular judicial system. Do you think I any did, of your colleagues mm -hmm. in the House from Arizona share any culpability in how this, how this all began? No, I don't, I don't believe any Congress member shares any culpability in the January 6th. I think there, there, there's does a lot the president, of high emotions. Does the president? No, no You don't think, not. I mean, the, the argument is that he set the tenor of doubting the election results, he was very strong about it, and set the wheels into motion for what happened on January 6th. Well, he certainly believes that the election was stolen, but that doesn't, he didn't incentivize people to go break into the capital of the United States. No, the President Trump is, is, had, he did not cause that, and nor did any Congress member from Arizona. One more no, thing I mean, before. It was, it, was, it's, it was bad, and I knew, actually, I was on a TV interview the week before saying something was going to go down. 
But I really thought it was going to be once people saw that Biden was going to be elected, that then they would be elected, that then they would surround the whole building. I never thought in a million years that the U.S. Capitol would be broken into. I thought they would have secured that. Wow, that's it. that's very interesting. Okay, one more thing. You're redrawing all these congressional districts in Arizona right now, and it appears that your district, which was very safe, that you might have a Republican advantage of maybe 4%. What, what does the future hold for CD8 in the West Valley? Well, I guess we'll find out at the end of the year. Um, they're supposed to have the maps done when December 22nd, and then I've been told that there's going to be lawsuits. If the Democrats are mad, they're going to sue. If the Republicans are mad, they're going to sue. So uh, just well, maybe like that's a good summer, sign that they maybe that's a good sign that the commission got it right. If everybody's mad, I don't know. We'll find out. Good to see you. Thank you, Congresswoman.